Hi, welcome. Uh, this is HikerDB. Uh, our project is on crowdsourcing hiking trail data through mobile and web applications. So we're going to want to start out by saying hello. Uh, my name is Brian Elliott. This is my partner, uh, Victoria Wilson. We both really like hiking and we wanted to make an app. And just a little bit about both of us. Uh, we're both uh, ICAM and TNS, dual concentrations here in ISAT. Um, so the application stuff is kind of right down our alley and we had an interest with it. Uh, so to begin, we're going to talk about the beginnings of our idea. So our problem that we are trying to solve is basically we have, if you go to Shenandoah Valley National Park website, you're not going to have the most up-to-date information. It'll show you, okay, this you know trail is five miles long, it'll tell you like a brief description about, but what if there's a trail down in the path? You won't know that. So the whole purpose of our application is to give you up-to-date information about the trail areas around the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, to begin, we were first looking at these different features listed. So we had the weather feature, a social media feature, different levels for content moderation, so different levels of users, built-in maps, trail recommendations, and personal trail lists. All of these things we ended up scrapping due to the time constraint we had with our capstone. So the weather feature, we went into class and we told our class about the weather feature, and they were, uh, we said, you know, we're thinking about putting this in our application. Does that make sense? And they're like, no, because I can easily just go to the weather app on my phone already, so this would just be not really needed for our application. We were thinking of doing the social media aspect because it'd be really cool to just, you know, log into the application with Facebook and uh, Twitter or Instagram, but we weren't able to get that far with the application. The built-in maps was an idea we had at the very beginning. It would allow you to download the, app, the map onto your phone and allow you to navigate the trails without having a problem but due to the time history we weren't able to do that and then the last two were trail recom trail recommendation and personal trail list basically the trail recommendations would be based off of the personal trail list that you had done in the past so whatever you've hiked in the past it would base your recommendations off of that uh, to look at how we are going to create the mobile application, we created a wireframe. A wireframe is essential to the application process because it allows you to have a base in order to build your application off of. So if you look at this, this was our beginning wireframe. The one aspect of this wireframe that we took out was this weather feature. So not that you can read it very well, but we had a tile view as our main menu. And this was gonna be the weather button. This was gonna be a trail list button. This was gonna be an about, and this was gonna go to the profile. We ended up scrapping the weather feature, as I said before, and now the home page is just the hiker or the trails list that we have. So, so a little bit about the early stages of the back end. Um, our back end is just kind of our, our web server where we host our web app um, and our database as well. So it's kind of where half of our project lives and all the information for our project. Originally, we wanted to go with what was called a mean stack. Um, you can think of a stack as a set of services or frameworks we use to kind of build our backend, build our server, build our database. Um, originally, we wanted to use what was called MongoDB. Uh, that's a non-relational style database, so you think everything's kind of stored as a, uh, sort of like a text document. There's no relations between um, different uh, tables in the database, so trails wouldn't have any relations to the users. Users wouldn't have any relations to anything else in the application. They just kind of stay as they are. Um, Express would have been used to kind of control how our database um, and our applications would have interacted with each other. Uh, Angular there is what we use for our web application itself. It's the framework we use to make writing web applications easier. Um, it provides a framework that's, it, it's really easy to just kind of get information, display information, and make interacting with the user a lot easier than trying to write it all yourself. And then Node.js would be our runtime environment, which is where we would run our Express.js code and our Angular code for the database and the web app. Um, originally, we wanted to do all of our own handwritten API and endpoints. We're going to talk about what that means a little bit later. Um, but that would have let us specify more how the application would interact with the database. And we would have written out all those uh, kind of like the code and rules for that by ourselves. And then we also originally wanted to use MongoDB for our database, which, as I mentioned before, was non-relational. But as we're going to touch on a little bit later, that wasn't quite ideal for our application. 
So the finalization of HackerDB is a, we create an app in order to create a community among people in the Shenandoah Valley. So this allows users to go ahead and create trails, update trails, and look at the trails and figure out if they want to go hiking. So with our application, it allows us to create a community within the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, the finalization features for the app consists of a creation of trails, a trail list, an edit trails, and a trail display so to view the trail. You have your profile of which you can edit, and then you have a create a user and a login. For the back end, we ended up going with an AWS uh, web server. At least the tier we used, which is an EC2 micro, was a free web server we could use for a year. So this allowed us to kind of have an environment to work in. We didn't have to pay for it, and it wasn't you know, too big that we were using too much, but it was kind of a nice size that we could work with um, without having to pay for anything. We also ended up using a MySQL database. Uh, I mentioned before we wanted to use Mongo. We found out that that really wasn't going to do what we wanted, and we were more familiar with MySQL, so MySQL was a better route for us to go down. Uh, we also ended up using Loopback for API service. Uh, I'm going to touch on what Loopback is uh, further in the presentation when I start talking about the API. But you can think of Loopback as a method to make our APIs a little bit easier. Originally, we wanted to handwrite everything, um, and we decided that by going with Loopback, we would save a bit of time. Uh, we ended up using kind of a hybrid in LAMP stack. Um, I mentioned what the mean stack was before, using Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node. Um, and a LAMP stack is just using a Linux Apache server, uh, MySQL database, and some PHP. And that's the last bullet point there. We ended up using PHP for the Android API. Um, there was an issue with Loopback and Android that we're going to talk about later, and that was what we decided to go on for the Android API. So now we're going to talk about our first steps in thinking about our mobile application and our web application. So to begin this, we looked at the history, culture, politics, stakeholders of creating this application, and the main issues we saw with creating it is that there would be a a larger influx of individuals on the hiking trails who would require you know more uptake of the trails by you know park rangers and all that and the other problem we saw is the fact that you know we're telling users hey look here's a cool hiking trail you can go on but what if they get injured on that hiking trail are we liable for their injury or is it not our fault at all so and to expand upon that, we looked at the users that are going to be using our application. So we created personas in one of our class, of which we'll go ahead and look at next. So we have Amanda, who's brand new to hiking, you know, wants to see all the hiking trails around the area, but she doesn't know where to start. So she's looking for, or looking at HikerDB to find the trail she needs and to meet more people for this, you know, hobby that she's trying to have. We also have Fred, the free spirit. So he's an avid hiker. He knows most of the trails around the Shenandoah Valley, but you never know if with HikerDB, you're going to get a brand new trail that you've never heard of. So he's looking at HikerDB to find that brand new trail and to help moderate the trails that we have on our application. Sally is, as it says, the show off. So she basically wants to use HikerDB to show off all the things she's doing. So you know that person you see on Facebook that's like, oh yeah, I went here, oh yeah, I went there. This would be what she would use HikerDB for if we had the social media application within our HikerDB. Conrad is a Shenandoah National Park ranger, so he's going to be the person that, you know, he doesn't really need to use HikerDB, but he wants to help contribute to it. He wants to help make sure that the trail information is correct for other users. So he's going to help us moderate our application. And then the last person we have is Anna Banana. So she, you know, she doesn't really understand the mobile application. She doesn't under, like understand the layout. So she's going to go ahead and use the application, but we needed bigger buttons and larger text views so she can see and read it without having to say, hey, like, grandkid, can you read this for me? So sh we wanted to create an application where any age could use it and not have a problem. So obviously from going through this, design, code, publish, that all seems easy, right? But it really isn't that simple. So we want to go into kind of talk about the steps <coughs> we had to take from this point to actually create our application in each part of it. And we want to start with the API. Um, so I talked about an API beforehand, and I, I said the word a lot, but never explained it. Um, you can think of an API kind of as, as the middleman between the application and the database. It's kind of what handles all the transactions between the two of them. Uh, and to kind of go a bit more into it, 
Um, it's called an application programming interface. It's what API stands for. And you can think of it as a particular set of rules or code that a software program can use to communicate with another software program, in this case, a database. Um, and so it serves as an interface between our application and our database in the same way that a uh, user interface serves as an, uh, a middleman between the user and an application. So it gives you a set of rules or a set of buttons you can press and use to interact with an application. And the API gives the application you know, certain endpoints and certain commands it can use on the database to either push data into it or get data from it. So why did we choose Loopback for this? Uh, well, Loopback was a framework that we found that was for API creation. Um, on the surface, it looked really great. Endpoint creation was easy. It was pretty much show it where your database is, and it creates every single endpoint you can imagine. An endpoint is kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like a web link you can hit, and it returns uh, data to you, or you can send data to that specific URL, and it'll pass it into the database. It relieved a lot of work for coding every endpoint like we originally wanted to do. So this just generated tons of them for us and we had every endpoint we could possibly want at our hands. Um, it made the API nice and secure, so we were able to authenticate who was accessing our API. So if I walked up to him and I said, hi, I'm Brian, I want to access the API and I handed my key, it's going to take my key and go, okay, I know who you are, go ahead, and it's going to give me access to it. And it was also usable with Android, which is great, because that was kind of the main reason we needed an API. Uh, it's because the Android application really had no way to interact with the database unless it has something between it that it can use. Um, and in theory, this would all save time. Uh, although we come to find out, maybe it didn't. So this is a taking a look at the endpoints that Loopback created. So we can see it has all of its HTTP methods here. Um, these are just specifying if we're getting data or if we're putting data in. And we can see here, at least for the Trails one, we have our basic Trails information. Uh, if we want to specify a certain Trail ID, so we want to get information about just a single Trail or put information in for just a single Trail. And Loopback auto-generated every single one of these endpoints for us. So it created lots of ways that our application can interact with our database. Um, and since they were auto-generated, we didn't have to worry about writing every single one of them. So this is a super simple diagram of kind of how an API works, at least in our case is that we have our app all the way here on the left, and our app is going to send a GET request to our API saying, I want to get all the trails information. The API is going to say, OK, database, I need all the information in the trails table. The database is going to pass that information back to the API, and then the API is going to send that information to the application in a format that's called JSON. So if you look at JSON, it's really messy. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's a lot of characters, uh, you know, there's some actual words in there, there's some colons, uh, quotations, and to a human reader, this doesn't exactly make a lot of sense, so it's not really useful to us until we've processed it. But if we want to take a look at just one snippet of it, in a nice pretty format, we can see that really this JSON has all the information that's in our trail table, in this case, you know, we have our ID, we have our name, we've got the park the trail's in, um, we've got the distance it is in miles, so we have all of our information there. And the point of that JSON is to give a standardized format for all the data that's in our database so the application can take it, it can parse through it, and it can give it to the user <coughs> in a way that's meaningful to them uh, so they can make sense of what all that is. So we're, now we're going to go into the web app. Uh, we made two applications. We made a web application and a mobile application so that people could use our service on a computer as well as on an Android device. So. The key components of our web application are firstly Node.js. I touched on this before. It's a JavaScript runtime environment, so this is where we kind of execute all of our JavaScript code. It's what holds our um, Angular application that we build, our web application. And it's also what runs our API framework for us. So we used Angular, uh, as I mentioned before again, it was our JavaScript framework we used to create the web application. This made it really easy to access the API, to take the information it gave us and display it out. Um, so the user could at least see it and interact with it without having to write uh, really a ton of JavaScript. Um, this just gave us a couple of easy methods we could call to do all that for us. And then we use basic HTML and CSS to build the website. Uh, that just specifies what text is going where, what color is it going to be, you know, where is it located on the page. So go quickly to our web app and demo that for you. There we go. Okay. 
So this is what you're greeted with when you come to the web app itself. It's just a basic login page. And since we don't have an account yet, we want to register. So we'll click register. And we need to give it an email. Um, I want to thank my parents for coming out here. So we're going to make the email David, which is my father's name, and then at Brendan.com. Isn't a standard email address, but it works. And then for the password, uh, we're just going to enter test for now, which is just four characters. Uh, and then we'll submit. So it creates a user for us. It takes us back to the login page, autofills that so we can just click submit and go in again. And now we're inside of our web app. So here we can see that we have a list of trails that the user can interact with. It's easy to bring up a trail by just clicking on a name. Uh, we'll use Hawksville for an example. So we've got some information about Hawksville. It's displayed to the user. Uh, we don't have an image for it right now, but someone can add that if they wanted to. Um, so yeah, we can see all the information. It's given to us the way that you know kind of makes sense. And if we as a user decide that, oh, well, I want to add a part of a description to Hawksville. I know something else. We can go down to the edit trail button at the bottom. And it brings up an edit kind of format here. So we're going to go to the description and resize it real quick just so we can edit it. And we're going to say, I really like this trail. Thank you. And although that's you know maybe not the most descriptive for the trail, it at least shows you can add information to a trail um, should you want to. And we'll just click save trail. And then we can see that it updated in our description that this person really likes the trail, we should hike it. So maybe someone finds that that's not really you know, relevant for a description, they could go in and edit that out if they wanted to and replace it with information that's uh, relevant to the trail. It's not just someone saying that they really like it. So if we decide we're done uh, playing around on the web application, we're done looking at trails, we don't need to edit anything, we can go up to the top and click log out, and that'll log us out of the application. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and talk about the Android application. Yeah. Um, the Android application was built in Android Studio, and the three or the two components within Android Studio that you use is XML and Java. XML is used to give you the basic layout, so the design of each page for the application, and Java is used to uh, is to use when you click the button, it'll go ahead and perform a certain test. So maybe when you click the button, it'll log you in. So it's going to bring you to a different page and make check to see or verify that you're a user within the database, but that's what the Java is going to do for you. PHP was used in the API creation, so whenever I would send that login, it would go to PHP and say, hey, is this a user within our database? And then a SQL statement would say, okay, check to see that you know, Vicky's in the database, and if I was and I gave them the correct password, it would then therefore log me in. So I'm going to go through the different pages of the application. This is the login and the register page. On the register page, if you put in two passwords that don't match, it will tell you, hey, your passwords don't match, and they'll have you re-register uh, your user. If you are going to just log in, you obviously need to provide a username and password, and then press the login button, and it's going to bring you to the next page, which is the home. It's more of a list view, so it shows you automatically what trails we have on our application. And you can either choose to hit view profile to view your profile that you created or edit it, which is the next part it goes through from profile, or you can hit add a trail and that will allow you to add a new trail that will show up in this list. So to go with the trail portion of the application, the first image is a view of what you see when you're looking at one of the trails you selected from the list view. The second one is going to be when you edit the trail. So if you want to say, hey, instead of saying it's just in Harrisburg, maybe I should specify a state. So you could go ahead and hit Virginia and it'll save the changes and put it over to the normal view. And the last one that we have on there is the add trail. So you'd be able to enter all the trail information that you know about the trail, hit add trail, and then it'll update on the list view. The second portion of our application is the profile. So this is the basic profile view. So it'll say your name, you know, your username, your email, your experience, and then the second part of it is you going ahead and editing your profile. So you can either edit the username, email, or experience. I don't allow you to change your name because you should just use the same name you provided at the beginning of registering. So from that, I'm going to go ahead and demo the application on my phone so you can see the full functionality of it. And this should be one. 
because the hash function I use is MD5 and it hashes it before it sends it over to the database. And then you can yeah, um, so we had a lot of issues with loopback in Android as Vicky mentioned before. Um, we wanted to use loopback because it would have saved us time. Uh, it would have made our API creation a whole lot easier. And what we come to find out is that Android actually had a really big problem working with loopback. Um, the SDK that they had released for you to work with the framework actually caused a lot more problems than it really gave us uh, a solution to everything we wanted. Uh, and we also had a problem with Loopback and MySQL cooperating together. Uh, as you saw in the web app, it had a decent bit less functionality than the Android application did. And this is because we had a problem with Loopback cooperating with MySQL auto increments um, on ID values in the database. So you can think when we have a user um, a user value in our user's table of our database, we give it a unique ID. Uh, it's to separate it from every single other user, whether, you know, we're not, we're still worried about them having the same email or having, you know, similar characteristics, but giving them a unique ID lets us separate them from every single other user um, in a unique way. And so we can make sure every single user is identical because they each have their own ID. And the way we set those IDs is that every time we insert a user, we autofill that value with whatever, which with whatever um, ID needs to go next. So if our last user was 77, then the next user that gets created would be 78. And what we found out is that loopback, since it kind of creates a schema for every single endpoint that we want to access, you know, we want to access um, the user's endpoint on our API because we want to create a new user. Well, it autofills a schema for us, and it says that that user ID value by default is going to be zero. And so when he tries to create a new user, it tries to put in that zero value. And since that zero value already exists, we can put in the user. Uh, and at the moment, Loopback doesn't have a method to work with the auto increments in MySQL. Uh, it's posted that they're updating it and working on it. But even up till today, they don't have anything out for it. Um, and we noticed that a bit late in our application. Um, and we just really weren't able to fix it in a timely manner and, and get a different method up and going. And that's the same issue for the trails as well. We weren't able to add trails on the web application uh, because we couldn't specify what the next trail ID was going to be. So in short, in order to make anything like be usable, we had to like stop one application from working in order to work on another. So we were, have been working on Brian's application and then we realized, hey, auto increment isn't working. So we switched it to have auto increment working. Then my application started working, but his stopped working. And so that's why there's a difference between so we're going to talk about the things we could have done differently. Uh, personally, I could have looked into loopback more and try to troubleshoot the issues that we were having with connectivity. Uh, the only problem is that we had a shortness of time at this point when we realized this problem. And so the easiest way we could do was create the own APIs and scrap uh, loopback for the Android portion. I could have used Volley, which is it basically makes API request or using an API faster and more efficient, but I chose to just go with PHP as that was something I'd already knew how to do. And then the link to social media would have been really cool, but as we said, the lack of time created a lot of problems for us. Sure. Um, some other things we could have done is use what's called Google Firebase. Um, it's more or less what Loopback is as well, except it's done by Google, which does most of the Android um, SDK stuff. So it would have, we knew at that point it would have worked well. So that's probably what route we should have gone down, but we didn't think about it at the time. Um, we could have just created our own API, which is what we ended up doing in the end for the Android application anyway. Um, we ended up writing it out in PHP, writing our own endpoints, specifying how they were going to interact with the database, and just kind of scrapping loopback all together for the Android app. Um, and then. We could have also just focused on one application. Uh, for two people working on, a, on this project and trying to do two different applications and trying to develop the API, it was a lot of work, um, I think, just for two of us to do. And we kind of spread ourselves thin in some areas and weren't able to learn it, I guess, in, a, in as depth as we should have um, or as we could have to make everything run a bit smoother. So it caused a bit bumps in the road because we were just trying to do a lot uh, with not a lot of people. And the reason we were trying to use like loopback or do something like um, like just trying new things is because I we already knew how to do most of the stuff. I already knew how to do Android Studio and do uh, a mean stack. Like that was something I already knew. So I was trying to, sorry, a Linux, a LAMP stack, sorry. I already knew how to do a LAMP stack. And so trying to do a mean stack would be something really cool to say, hey, look, I have experience with both of these. But in short, we just had to go back to the thing that we knew best. And so that's why we ended up doing it as we did. 
So we have one reference, and that's for our API definition. And then we would Yeah, like we want to acknowledge um, a couple of our professors and students, uh, specifically Dr. Anthony Teat for being our faculty advisor for this project. Uh, he helped us a lot with kind of the scope of our project, helping us troubleshoot issues that we were having, being supportive while we were kind of going about developing this, because we had a lot of issues along the way, and it kind of caused us a ruckus, but you know, Teat helped us work through them and helped us figure out what, we were, what steps we were going to do next. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Bachman, who provided some of the earlier stages um, of kind of brain, uh, brainstorming our project. Yeah, uh, just coming up with some of the social issues we might face, the ethical issues we might face, um, and kind of getting the bare bones of our project together at the start. Uh, we also want to thank Andy Grosbo, who's one of our fellow ISAT students. Uh, she was with us at the start of our uh, project. She was originally going to do an iOS app for us. She had some other interests that she decided to follow instead, so she dropped off her project, but she helped a lot with the early uh, beginning stages. And then we want to thank other faculty and students that are out there that helped us, uh, just kind of supported us through the whole thing, um, helped talk through issues that we were having. Thank you. Questions? I may have missed this. But um, are the like is the database connected from the Android app and the web app? Yes, sorry. The um, the data is shared across both of them. So when you update uh, on the web application, it'll send it to the database, update the database, and then that'll pull the same information on the Android app. So that's if cool. I were to have looked at the trail that he changed, I would have seen the changes that he already created. Yeah, that's cool. Probably should have shown. Yeah. <laughs> is the app on the Google Play Store? No, and that's mainly based off of the fact that the, the, I want to say the authentication that we have to go through and the fact that the hashes are different, if you're ending up using his, you're never going to be able to log in on my mobile application. It's so because of these discrepancies, it's we have to fix these before it's you know usable on the Google Play Store because we don't want things to be different and have people you know, not be able to do what they need to do. And that issue goes back to the loopback not cooperating with MySQL, uh, which is why we couldn't share users. Were we going to let anybody um, edit any trail, or was that going to be restricted? The original idea was to allow anyone to edit uh, any trail. Um, as we mentioned before, we wanted to have different user permissions. So obviously people who have been using the app for a while, or people we know who know kind of like what's going on um, on the trails, they know a lot about them, we could give them an elevated permission. That would allow them to maybe approve an edit, or to go in and, and make you know bigger changes uh, to a trail. Um, to kind of remove information that's incorrect or you know roll back changes that people made to a trail. Thank you for coming out. Appreciate it.